同声也说两句话，你们说两句话呀，听不清楚。声音变大一些。说啊，同声传译试一下。好，听 ，OK。Testing, testing. Ah,、uh, this is the English channel. Can you hear me? This is interpreter speaking. Good afternoon, friends.、Uh, my name is、uh, Stephen Ango. I'm from Bloomberg. So I'm going to let them do the hard work, and I will speak English if that's okay. My name is Stephen Ango. I am a chief North Asia correspondent for Bloomberg Television, and、uh, thank you very much for joining us、uh, for this coffee with Ren. This gentleman here, of course. Is the the distinguished guest as well as the other panelists here?、Um, again, we also welcome the international media、uh, and also domestic media. Also, some invited guests from various parts of the world, including from Germany, I believe, here in front. We'd also like to welcome、uh, to this、uh, simulcast、uh, Bloomberg users who are on live go on the Bloomberg terminal, who will be listening around the world、uh, to this、uh, in-depth conversation. Uh, with、uh, Ren Zhengfei, of course, and the others here on the panel. Let me introduce them、uh, before we get into it. Of course,、uh, here on my left we have Kishore Mabubani. He is the former president of the United Nations Security Council. He is also the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School at the National University of Singapore, and he was with the Singapore Foreign Service for 33 years. Thank you very much for joining us, Kishore. Also. Detlef Zulki, he is known as the spiritual father of the smart factory.、I'd、like to know a little bit more about what a spiritual father is of a smart factory.、Uh, many years, I believe, as well at Lufthansa, the German airline.、Uh, he is also a professor emeritus of the Technical University of Kaiserslautern and a retired director of the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence at Kaiserslautern. And of course, Ren Zhengfei, the CEO and founder. Of Huawei Technologies, and to his left, Liu Fei, head of 5G security research at Huawei,、uh, scientist here、uh, for security at Huawei. Now, of course, we are finally in the digital age, of course, and 5G is finally upon us.、Uh, with China, of course, just at the beginning of this month, officially launching commercial services, and the world shall soon follow. 5G is definitely here. So my car. And my coffee maker can finally talk to each other. <laughs> Billions, in fact, of devices are going to be able to talk to each other. It's a platform in which commerce of the 21st century and beyond is going to be built. And of course, we all know the geopolitical battle lines are going to be drawn if they have not already been drawn. Now, I've been promised we can talk about every subject today for the next hour and a half. So I want to invite all of you to, when I open up the floor to questions, to please raise your hand and ask a question to our distinguished panelists. They are here for all of you. Now, the U.S.-China trade war, of course, is not just about soybeans and saving face. It raises many questions about sovereignty, digital sovereignty, which is the title of this of this panel, as well as survival. We'll have to decide who's going to survive and who's not going to. Right? My first question to all of the panelists, and firstly to Mr. Ren: What's most at stake in this new digital battleground? What you say? I think that digital economy. Uh, is global to start with, because I don't think that、uh, digitalization is not bounded by geographic、uh, boundaries, and I think that digital is an irreversible trend, and it would not、uh, be bounded by、uh, fragmented regions. And I think that 
digital economy will only find a way to be monetized when it is global. That is why uh, looking into the future uh, when we are building a digital world, we think that uh, it will create a bigger scale than the industrial revolution and it will see faster speed as well. I think that in the future we'll be able to see uh, all kinds of views about digital development and I think that such diversified views are understandable because the different countries and the different people uh, have different understanding of the same trend because it's a nascent technology and a development. It's difficult for us to predict exactly what it will become in the future. In addition to that, this is beyond imagination. This is different from what we had in terms of breadth and width. For example, uh, when we invented trains, uh, we see that there was suspicion around trains. However, the trains became a technology that we were very certain about. However, when we envision the future information society, it is difficult to be so certain and sure as beyond our imagination, especially uh, when AI is the emerging technology from uh, its proposition up to today. It's been 70 to 80 years. However, it has not been implemented. It was because uh, there was uh, n no infrastructure to support it, including supercomputers and super large storage and also uh, ubiquitous connectivity. That should be the underlying infrastructure for AI. Fiber was there and fiber connected the world to some extent. However, it was not fully accessible with uh, the deployment of 5G. I think that it will accelerate artificial intelligence and democ uh, democratization of uh, AI. With that, uh, I think that we can unleash uh, all kinds of possibilities and they are beyond our imagination. What I can say is that it will greatly improve productivity. It will greatly uh, increase the wealth we create in the world. But at the same time, it might cause some issues and some people have uh, brought them up. For example, unemployment or social issues. But uh, as long as we are able to increase the wealth, I think it's a positive trend. And I think that a lot of problems have solutions. Different countries allocate digital wealth uh, with their own approach. I think that the problems involved will be addressed. I think that we're still in a discussion phase about how to address them. That's why we have two gurus here. I would like to listen to their opinions on these topics. I myself uh, am not a guru in the exp in the technologies. That's why I've got a scientist to help me answer some of the tech profound questions. Thank you. In just a minute, uh, Dadlef, maybe I can come to you. Uh, Ren Zhengfei talked about the increase in productivity. You're an expert in automation and factories and the smart factory. By how much can you quantify how more productive this world is going to be and who's going to be possibly left behind? Well, first of all, I cannot really quantify it. It's too early to say, to bring numbers for uh, this, uh, for a value here. But uh, you are absolutely right. The world is changing in that sense. There are several views on this uh, topic. On the one hand side, many people say, well, 5G is just the first of 4G, so why all this uh, trouble around? Uh, the more uh, important view is that we have completely new chances with 5G because we have now the ability of sending a lot of data with a very low latency uh, back and forth. And this offers us a high degree of mobility. So our future systems will become more mobile. And this is not only true for our private life, so for our driving on our bicycles or whatever else, so it's also for our factories. So 5G is now the game changer for industry. And this makes it on the one hand side so interesting for industry. On the other side, um, it has a vulnerability uh, against uh, threats from the outside. And this is why we have this talk here. And we have several uh, problems around the world addressing 
this. And I think it's very important that we have a deep discussion on this and finally we end up with trust so that everyone is happy with this new technology and can use it. Kishore, from a former diplomat's perspective, is there a huge trust deficit right now, globally, and exacerbated by the uncertainty that the trade war has caused mm. and the uncertain you know, prospects of security violations potentially in 5G? Yes, there is a trust deficit. <laughs> but the question is why? And here, it's, it, there's a very remarkable sort of coincidence here Within, on the one hand, clearly we are seeing this remarkable new technology arrive on the scene, 5G that's going to transform the world, make the human condition better. But it arrives at a moment of history where we're entering a tremendous new geopolitical contest uh, within the world's number one power, which today is the United States of America, and the world's number one emerging power, which is China. And as we know, this is, this is about thousands of years old. Whenever the emerging power is about to become bigger than the number one power, that's a moment of extreme tension. We are walking towards that. And in some ways, Huawei has become a sort of accidental victim. It's caught in the crossfire within these two great powers. And while in theory we should be rushing to embrace this new technology, this distrust <laughs> between the two powers means that whenever China puts forward something that's positive, the United States will see it as negative. And that's why, as you know, a major campaign has been launched uh, against Huawei. It's a bit sad because the world is going to be deprived of the wonders of this new technology because of these geopolitical complications. But I hope that in a, after our discussion today, we will try to find ways and means of building a bit more trust between these two powers so that at the end of the day, new technologies like the one being produced today here in Huawei can actually continue to help the world get better. Leo Fei, you're the scientist, you are the expert on security. Are those fears unwarranted? I mean, there are a lot of worries that too few operators, too few vendors have the channels that basically move all of our data, all of our sensitive information, and potentially puts sovereign nations at risk. Uh, yes. So, my boss asked me to speak in the second language, okay? <laughs> I will follow that. Cheers, yeah. It's a big boss. Okay. So, yeah, you are right. I agree with your opinion because uh, we have few operators and a few vendors there. And uh, the, the very heavy task to us to guarantee the security of the data or hardware or software, anything. But you know, we uh, telecommunication area, we only is one of the security roles, one of the roles. So we need to, like uh, telecommunications, I mean, that's mean, us. Okay, we need to follow all the regulations uh, by each of the countries. We need to follow the users, what they want. Okay, so the security, the whole network security is the overall security from the end to end and go through all the lifetime. So we can do that and every day we're just doing that. I'm very happy, we are very happy, I mean security researchers, because uh, finally we got a highlight here, because every day we work like, a, seems like a background. Okay, you can now see us, but today you can see us. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so yeah, this is the work we are doing. All right, we, we all promised that we're going to get right to the heart of the matter, and we're, we're going to do that. And I have to just put out a disclaimer as well, as the only American on this panel. Um, but of course, Bloomberg Television is, and Bloomberg is impartial, so my questions are not born of any bias. Um, so... I have to ask directly about some of the accusations, of course, that the United States uh, and others have expressed their concerns about Huawei and potential backdoors and 
security threats. Um, Mr. Wren, can you again categorically deny that there are any built-in loopholes or backdoors in your equipment? You told me I can ask you anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe not that. <laughs> You can ask me anything. About information security, actually this issue will always remain a very important issue. It's a bit like the shield and uh, the spear. For example, for encrypted key, even if you have the most safe key uh, with quantum computers, it will only take seconds to break that key. Maybe in the past it will take dozens or thousands of years to break that encryption. So I think information security is a, a relative term, not an absolute term. People talk about blockchain and praise how great that technology is, but in front of quantum computer, blockchain may be easy to uh, be broken. And actually, the paper money we use is part of the uh, blockchain. We have the encryption printed on the paper money. If there is fake money, then there's a loss of 100 euro or 100 US dollars. But the cryptocurrency, uh, maybe billions will be at lost if there is fake uh, cryptocurrency. So in terms of information security and encryption, this has always been a difficult issue for people to address. There will always be more attacks at higher level, and people will always try to find ways to strengthen protection. Can we use technical means to address this issue? But I think ultimately we have to count on laws and regulations. For example, we don't allow fake money to be used. And if you use fake money, you will be arrested by the policeman. And the policeman will trace down the very source of the fake money. So with the framework of laws and regulations, fake money cannot be used in the market so that we can guarantee the safety of currency. I think we also have to count on laws and regulations to safeguard uh, information security. If we blame uh, all the problems of uh, technologies uh, on technology, well, for example, for the car makers, if the car flip over, uh, you cannot always blame the car makers. We are only an equipment vendor, and our responsibility is to ensure that our equipment is free of such issues, and we are willing to make such commitment to governments around the world. And when we sell the equipment, it's a bit like we are selling cars to the market, and it is the telecom operators who operate and manage those data. It is the sovereign state who use laws and regulations to operate and manage those data on the networks. In all the countries where we operate, we have to comply with local laws and regulations and never disobey that. And by uh, this strict compliance, we safeguard the security of information and the network. So the responsibility that we take on uh, is, as I described, uh, we support the government uh, regulations. How do we then um, reconcile that there are concerns out there, whether it's Chinese or American concerns, about the trustworthiness. And I know the German uh, government is looking at their security catalog and possibly putting in a, a test of trustworthiness. Is that necessary or is that imperative because of the amount of data that is being transferred around the world and that will be transferred around the world? The data now is said to be the new oil. So it's sensitive and there are sovereign issues. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I think we, disc we are discussing all this because we recognize right now the value of data. And this is why we look for um, 
for security issues in that specific case. On the other side, I think we are looking now into the future and we see just one side of the problem. We always had security problems. We have security problems each day with Windows, for example, with browsers, so you can intrude your systems uh, and especially those hackers from, let's say, states around the world which are highly uh, equipped with, uh, with knowledge uh, can intrude uh, these systems and do something there. So what we are discussing here is just uh, to ease or just to prevent uh, such security problems for a new technology coming up. This is quite okay and normal, but also there, I think in future we will have always a situation that somebody will get into the systems, not via the Huawei equipment, but in the complete system of software of everything else what is there. So we should look into the complete system and say we have to improve the uh, security uh, of the system as seen uh, uh, as a complete system. Uh, on the other side, we now address fields where the vulnerability is much higher and perhaps much more dangerous, like uh, autonomous cars, for example, or using it in telemedicine applications, for example. So there we need a much higher level of security than perhaps just when exchanging our personal data to Google or to Facebook or something like this. So this is why we must have this discussion and this is also why we have uh, to have these rules, which you mentioned, which we developed in Germany and which will hopefully be also uh, developed by Europe as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as Europe itself. So um, let's wait for it. I think we need it. It will help us and the people to have the trust into all this. But we also need to have the, uh, the checking these rules uh, on the compliance uh, with, the, with the rules given. Kishore, do you believe that there needs to be, and it's possible to create global standards? Uh, yes, but I think it's important to understand that this is not a technical discussion. <laughs> what we are having is a political discussion. And for example, you, 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 you're right, uh, there have been allegations that uh, Huawei, through its equipment, is creating a backdoor, and through the backdoor, the Chinese intelligence agencies can go in and get the information. That's, sure, that's one allegation that's made. Like you, I'll try to be fair within America and, and China. <laughs> and it's also a fact, we know this, Edward Snowden has told us this. The National Security Agency of the United States can listen to every phone conversation in the world, can pick it up. It's, it, it's public information now. So clearly you have you know, not just one power that may be uh, spying on countries, lots of, lots, of, lots of powers are spying. So, if at the end of the day that's the core issue, then frankly the best way to resolve this is not to have a headlong clash between uh, United States and China, which is what's happening now, we should try to have a kind of global discussion. And I, as, you know, having served as ambassador to the UN for 10 years, I actually believe that multilateral rules and processes are the best way to resolve this. And the best way is to engage the whole world in the discussion of this, because the whole world, all, all 7.5 billion people of, in, on planet are going to be affected by these rules and regulations and the consequences. And I, I want to mention here that uh, I, I believe actually that Europe has a very a uh, critical role uh, to play here because Europe has got the advantage on the one hand of clearly being trusted by the uh, United States. It's uh, many uh, European states are allies of the United States. Uh, but on the other hand, you're, you're, you're big enough and strong enough to, in a sense, pass independent judgments. So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm actually quite impressed that uh, even though Australia, Canada, New Zealand have all joined the United States and said, no, 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 no to Huawei, Germany is still open. And Germany is saying, yes, let's, let's see whether this can work or not. But if we can all agree on a set of rules on what we can or cannot do with this technology, let's all abide by these rules and we'll have a, a, a better world. I think it can be done, but at the same time, there is one uh, hitch about multilateral rules. It ties all countries, mm. including the most powerful countries like America and China. They have to be bound by these multilateral rules. And that's why, you see, that's why, as you know, 
the United States is a bit wary of these multilateral rules and processes, even though I actually believe that it would be in the long-term interest of the United States to actually strengthen these multilateral rules. Well, we've seen the undermining of these multilateral bodies, whether it's the World Trade Organization or others, in current administrations that shall go nameless. But, <laughs> but the end result of this kind of protectionist or super competitiveness in 5G is a bifurcation of the next evolution of the Internet. Uh, you can have the Western Internet, and you can have a Chinese Internet. And that's very difficult to have a global standard and body for privacy and for standards and data protection. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. To be honest, I cannot agree with you. Because, okay. you mm -hmm. know, uh, the global standards is, is very important. Because the data from here to there, we need to make the, the same protocols. Yeah, that's right. But the different services, they have different like uh, requirement. Even you and me, we have the different, you know, the favor on the food or house or colors. So we cannot make very unified standard for all of the applications. The same way the security. Okay, so we're based on the global standards, make the security, make the like a connection, be secure, and then we gave the very colorful security solutions for every dedicated services, scenarios. So that depends, really. Yeah. Um, Mr. Wren, I mean, some in Europe, including under this GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation that was enacted in May of 2018, um, th there, there seems to be a call for, you know, to avoid monoculturalism on, on equipment purchases, on gear. So not to put all of the eggs in one basket, to have one particular vendor, because that could open up, even if it's not fact, at least the perception that there could be malfeasance going on. I mean, how, how, what are your main strategies when you're trying to sell gear to a particular country and they're saying, well, no, we're going to buy from many different vendors, not one? even though you might be the cheapest. <clears throat> First of all, we trust, we have to trust the federal government and uh, the German parliament that they will make the decision that is in the best interest of people. And German government base their conversation and discussion based on facts and evidence and they make important decisions based on facts and evidence. And German government uh, welcome multi-vendor to establish the network. We welcome that. It's a bit like building a wall. You may use one brick from Japan, one brick from Arabic country, or one brick from China. When you use bricks from different countries to build this wall, uh, maybe one brick can be broken, but other bricks can stand uh, quite in, still in place. So I do support the multi-vendor system or multi-vendor uh, mechanism. And Germany proposed digital sovereignty, and I think that is understandable. Because before the new things uh, come inside, we need the first brave person to try to get the first bite. Well, we say that uh, the system should be open, but naturally someone wants to be uh, protective of the existing things. And Germany has proposed that different parties should discuss, and one of the key topics is digital sovereignty. In the past, the society is mainly a physical society. And for physical society, people pay attention to the physical boundary. For example, I own certain land of certain acreage, and I own, uh, I own the plants on it and own the uh, mineral resources under it. But however, we are migrating from a physical world to the digital world, and digital assets knows no boundary. Then which country should benefit from digital asset, and by how much? I think this is a key question that we have to discuss. 
And this kind of discussion doesn't mean that it will contravene economic development. I think it will go side by side uh, with economic development. Well, Germany has proposed these ideas and rules, uh, for example, to treat all vendors alike, treat all vendors equally. Like um, Professor Zuki mentioned, what is a rule? Uh, uh, what is information security? Information security means we all have to abide by the same rule. For Huawei, we've been operating around the world, and we have to abide by local laws and regulations. For example, the laws and regulations in Germany might be different than the ones in Africa. Uh, then in different countries, we have to comply with local laws and regulations. Otherwise, we cannot survive. So I firmly believe the multi-vendor um, proposal to build the network as a sovereign state uh, Germany will have uh, the right to manage uh, the digital uh, framework. I fully support that. It's months or so since the blacklist came out. Uh, how have you adapted to that and built your business and, you know, not necessarily, of course, rely on the United States? So here now, we may. First of all, uh, we would like to express the thanks to the U.S. suppliers uh, for their support and help for the past 30 years. Without them, we would not have become who we are today. We always would like to work with uh, the American suppliers uh, into the future, and together uh, we're always willing to work out solutions to serve the customers. Uh, we always embrace globalization. This is our position. But now, uh, with the entity list and uh, the supplies have been stopped, uh, we have the ability to survive. However, this is not what we pursue. We have no intention, and I personally don't support doing everything, every innovation ourselves. But if uh, we have to do it, then we have a temporary uh, approach that we will work on it ourselves. However, this is not our long-term strategy. Uh, now uh, we have no problem to sustain our development by working out the problems and working on the innovation. I hope that we can come back and have another coffee talk. By that time, you'll be able to see that we have a he healthy development. For the first half of this year, uh, we didn't have uh, the sanctions. We had very rapid growth. And after the implementation of the sanction measures, we still uh, have the good foundation to rely on. Now we've got uh, different releases and uh, versions of the products. And next year, the results will be felt. If uh, by the end of next year, we're still able to live a healthy business, it means that we have already withstood the survival crisis. After that, we will focus more on the technology research. Of course, we would like to lead the technology, but we do need to research the series to see whether we will have that edge, and we're still making adjustments. I hope that we'll still have the ability and power to lead. With that said, the U.S. sanctions uh, have uh, driven us to work harder and has helped us to get rid of the uh, slack. And we're now working very hard and sometimes uh, a bit hard. And we have uh, got an increase in sales revenue and uh, profits. But I think that uh, we need to balance them a little bit. In the future, we'll have uh, some measures to balance our sales revenue and profits to make sure that it's uh, sustainable. Yes. On the uh, entity list, because uh, the decision on the entity list, entity list, you could say was a technical decision, but it was more of a political decision. As you know, I, took, I just finished a book on U.S.-China 
right here. Relations. No, no, that, that's my previous book. Oh, this, yeah, this one has the West lost it. <laughs> Rhetorical question. And the next one is, has China won? <laughs> no, but the, the decision to put Huawei on the entity list was part of a broader, in a sense, a geopolitical decision that was made by the United States that China is becoming too strong too quickly and we should find ways and means of slowing down uh, China's rise. And there are some people who in, in, in Washington, D.C., some policymakers who genuinely believe that the best way to slow China's growth down is to have a kind of a decoupling between the U.S. and Chinese economies, because if you have a decoupling, uh, United States with a stronger economy will keep growing, China the weaker economy will go down. And that's, that's the strategic calculations, I think, behind the entity list. But I think that those people who made that decision, I think, were very unwise. Because it's hard to imagine, from, if you look at where China has come from, right? In 1980, in purchasing power parity terms, China's GNP was 10% that of the United States. Today, in purchasing power parity terms, it's bigger than the United States. So having come such a long way, it's hard to believe that if you create an entities list, China's growth is going to slow down. So that was, a, I think, a strategic mistake on the part of the policymakers in Washington, D.C. And that's why I think they should reconsider their strategy and ask themselves, what is really going to work in this new world? I, will, will isolating China work? Or will cooperating with China work? And the other critical thing is this. The rest of the world is, are not going to be passive bystanders, you know. They're going to do their own calculations, what's in their interest. And if, you know, we, 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 we toured the Huawei laboratory this morning and that the amazing breakthroughs, the rest of the world wants to embrace them. So I cannot imagine the rest of the world walking away from Huawei or walking away from China because of a geopolitical decision made in Washington, D.C. And that, that's why I hope that in a discussion like this, uh, people in Washington, D.C. will begin to think again, is it wise to adopt this strategy? Why not try something else? You seem to be, though, dismissing the security concerns. Well, uh, it, it, there may be security concerns, but why not discuss them openly? I mean, I, my understanding is that Huawei is ready to, to talk to the U.S. and say, okay, come and tell me what your concerns are and what can be done. And, and, and why not, in a sense, have a three-way discussion within Europe, uh, Huawei, and uh, United States. And then we can try to figure out what the real concerns are and what can be met. But remember, remember my earlier point. Um, we do know that the United States also is picking up all the information. So it's not just, if it's China, it's not just China. So the question is, why don't we agree on a common set of rules which will restrain all countries, including China and United States, equally? Yeah, I mean, we'll talk about it in just a minute, surveillance capitalism. Hmm. I mean, it's already happening in the United States, whether it's Google or Microsoft or some of these other companies that are mining your data, and you tick the box that you allow them to collect your data, and then where is that data and how is that data used? So you lose your digital sovereignty, your individual digital sovereignty. But on the security front, I want to bring you back in, Detlef, and also, of course, you, Leo. Um, while we're talking about, you know, the robustness of security in building, say, a factory, because we know that 5G is going to create this platform for critical industries to communicate and to be more efficient, whether it's energy, transportation, banking, very critical sovereign interest um, industries. How do we make, when you say set up a smart factory on a 5G network in a critical industry, how do you make it safe? Well, look into the airplanes. You need redundancy. So this is, I think, the only thing which you can um, uh, convince the people of having re a real security in high-risk uh, systems. So you will have uh, 5G for communication, but you will have perhaps other paths like cable, uh, still cables running around and using these cables uh, as a redundant uh, system. Um, nevertheless, also when you use cables, you finally end up in some service or so and you will have the same problems because you will always have 
the possibility of having security leaks somewhere. So we have, to, we have learned how to deal with all this over the last years. We have seen that uh, we have never 100% security and I'm pretty sure that we also will not have 100% security in the future. But we have to get um, experiences with these new technologies. Now we are just at the edge of introducing 5G. I think in perhaps two or three years we will have much more confidence about the levels of security of this system, not at, as 5G itself, but in the, in the complete environment of our factory, for example. So, uh, but we need time to get this, to, to get all this. And finally, what I said already, we also need trust, we need rules, and we need the confidence when we collaborate with one. So we have a very close collaboration for years already with uh, Huawei in Germany. So they have a research lab in Germany, they do research in Germany, uh, they uh, send us the newest versions of their software, for example, we can test it in our factories. So there we have trust because we have partners we really collaborate with. And uh, based on this trust, we can make our decisions in future and also uh, make the decisions for our industrial partners as well. And I think this is very important. So just not just ban one company and say this one is bad and the other, other one is good but really try to develop the trust in a network of partners. And I think this is uh, one of the major advantages of our smart factory network with our 53 partners, that we can generate this trust. Leo, from a security perspective, how do you generate that trust through verification and you know, also opening up your equipment, whether it's open source or what, to show that there are not back doors, but also that your equipment cannot be hacked by other parties? not only Huawei's equipment, but also like uh, other vendors' equipment. All the vendors need to pass like a verification, like a common criteria, rear, uh, Professor mentioned. Like uh, they have the very different security levels. And for each of the levels, they have very different definition, how to check, how to audit, and what about the coding, what about the process of the, the, in your factory, and how about like uh, attacking scenario. So that's very different for each of the level. So basically, uh, for example, the SIM card in your mobile phone. Operators, when they purchase like a SIM card, just for example, they can choose the different security level to purchase the SIM card. So basically, maybe EL4 Plus or EL5, that's a higher level for security mechanism. So when they purchase that, they can say, OK, if my uh, subscriber use this SIM card, the SIM card cannot be cloned or even be stolen cannot be get the uh, get the message from the sim card okay so that different levels so all the windows need to pass the verification even common criteria and uh, like today we have i mean telecommunication uh, area have the very uh, new verification mechanisms like uh, uh, NISAs, SCAS, defined by 3GPP and the GSMA and other organizations. Yes, we, we do have follow that. Ren, if I can talk maybe a little bit about the consumer side of the business and where you hope to take that business. I know you're going to have a folding phone coming out momentarily if it hasn't already hit the market. But of course, also part of this um, blacklist, if you will, you know, the, you cannot have on your Mate 10 newest phone the Google suite of applications. How does that affect your sales globally? A and how does that maybe spur you to do more R&D into your own operating system, Harmony OS? Yes, uh, indeed, there has been an impact And we have uh, reached agreements uh, with uh, Google and under the framework of agreements, uh, we both work hard to build an ecosystem for the world. And now uh, because of the entity list and because of the uh, supplies being cut, uh, that has been an impact. 
But apart from the uh, Google-related apps, we still have a lot of features and functions. Uh, our Mate 30 has not pre-installed uh, Google OS. However, our Mate 30 still sees a lot of sales. It means that a lot of consumers still are willing to accept our phones. Uh, the impact in non-China region is bigger than the China region in terms of the smartphone business. So we do have to uh, slow down business in the non-China region a little bit. And we have mobilized our scientists, experts, thousands of people in these domains. And they are working harder to address these issues. And we uh, explore the future uh, with these resources. Now we are allocating some of the resources to help us fix the holes. We're still working on it. The president of corporate strategy told Bloomberg yesterday that your uh, smartphone shipments next year, in 2020, will grow 20 percent and that you could get up to 50 percent of market share domestically in China for smartphones. I mean, is this evidence that the Trump measures against Huawei are not working? Well, uh, I haven't heard of this data yet, but this year the shipment will be around 240 to 250 million, and they expect that next year there will be a big growth. However, we don't know about the future situations we might face, so I'm not certain about the situation for our CBG next year. Worst case scenarios, best case scenarios. <laughs> I think the worst case scenario is what we have now, around 2.4, 2.5. I mean, I mean, 240 or 250 million. I think that will be the worst case scenario, and I think things will start to get better and better. Encouraged uh, Wilbur Ross, the U.S. Commerce Secretary, uh, told Bloomberg Television over this weekend that new licenses for Huawei could be forthcoming uh, very soon. So that we'll, we'll have to wait to see how that comes out. Now, maybe I'll open this up to a further conversation here because of the situation that Huawei finds itself in, whether it is through Android and some of the licensing there, or also on the chipset software. Uh, companies like Cadence and Synopsys. Uh, in the world right now, in the tech world, is there too much reliance on these U.S. vendors for companies like Huawei? And will this, if it is a bifurcation, will it do the opposite, maybe affect, spur domestic um, creation of these kinds of software and products? Well, you know, I, I'm not the uh, technical expert on this uh, panel, but I, I, I do think that it's, if you take a long-term view, is it wiser for the United States to have a China that is competing with it, is completely independent of reliance on the United States, or that it still continues to rely on the United States in many areas? And the, the, the result of having a lack of strategy in Washington, D.C., is that the United States is pursuing a course of action that may be damaging to long-term American interests if you see yourself as a long-term geostrategic player. And so it is actually in America's interest to see a continued Chinese dependence on, on American technology, on American companies, because at that, at the end of the day, gives you some degree of leverage. But a China that is completely independent, then you have little or no leverage. And this is why I actually was very puzzled by the decision not to allow Google onto Huawei phones, because if I, if I may be politically incorrect, <laughs> <laughs> Google, at the end of the day, is an American Trojan horse. Because once you hook onto Google, you are now hooked on to an American information ecosystem. And that delivers to you, you know, not just American information, American values, American perspectives. You see the world through Google eyes. <laughs> and here is Huawei offering the United States the opportunity to put an American Trojan horse into a Chinese phone 
And, and America is saying no. <laughs> and that doesn't make sense. It's not logical. But that <laughs> lack of logic shows the lack of long-term strategic thinking, you know? And, and that's what puzzles me about the people in Washington, D.C., because you, you're, you're really shooting yourself in the foot when you say, don't take Google. <laughs> Ren, you were smiling. I think you agree. <laughs> I fully agree uh, with Kishore and his views. Well, U.S. has technology supremacy and the highest mountain in the world is Mount ha uh, Himalaya, Mount Everest. U.S. is like Mount Everest. And China is a bit uh, lagging behind, maybe at the foot of Mount Everest. You know the, uh, the snow uh, capping on the top of Mount Everest, and the uh, melted water should flow downhill to irrigate the paddy and uh, feed the sheep, and U.S. companies can get benefit from those water flowing from the top of the Mount Everest downwards. But if U.S. decides to sever the water and prevent the water from flowing downwards, then people downhill might drill wheels underground, and then they can have their water sufficiency. They don't pay to the U.S. for the water from the top. And there will definitely be alternatives. I think countries should make hard effort to enter into this technology field and embrace new opportunities. I think all countries should take actions, action now. Well, whether China will take um, corresponding actions, that is still a question mark because the industrial base is not very strong. Even though the GDP is big, um, but we mainly produce low value added products. But European countries are not the case. At least Germany is not the case. So I think the rest of the countries should quickly drill their own will own well instead of counting on the water melted from the top of the Mount Everest. Think about it. If the water cannot flow downwards, then the water will be frozen on the top. If it is frozen on the top, then what about the Wall Street? Without the water flowing downwards, they will not have the money. Is that in agreement? Oh, yeah. or is, Absolutely. I mean, so, uh, is there this surveillance dividend paying out to people who are mining the data and selling it onwards? Actually not, I would think. So, uh, <laughs> well, uh, we are in some sort squeezed in between these uh, two fighters right now, and uh, we have to but see you're how, quite, to, you're quite how to get so. out. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think no one is really happy about what's developed over the last years. Also not the, uh, the U.S. industry, I guess. They are more for open borders. And we all were uh, benefiting from the open borders and the open markets. And the customers were able to buy the best phones around whatever they want, whether they buy an Apple phone or a Huawei phone or a Samsung phone. Um, now when we close these borders, we all will lose. So we will have only losers. So my uh, hope is that within the next weeks or so, and the first signs look quite nice, and the stock markets are going up already a little bit due to these signs, that there will be an agreement between China and the U.S. And I hope that's it, that this agreement will also cover the problems with Huawei, perhaps also setting up rules and checking these rules, having independent organizations, whatever else. And I think as soon as we have such an agreement, uh, we can think about the real problems and not about this stuff. Yeah, phase one agreement, though, might not include Huawei or these maybe, issues. Maybe a phase one, but, but it's a beginning. So I think it's, a, it's more a trade war. It was, was always announced as a trade war. And I think uh, uh, it's t completely wrong to say it's easy to win a trade war. It's not. All will be the losers of a trade war. So we need a solution for this. And this is now, I think, especially before the elections in the U.S., the right time to move forward into the direction of having an agreement, perhaps not a final agreement in two weeks or so, but having a stepwise agreement so that everyone is recognizing we are moving 
again to a collaboration on the world level and everything will benefit from this and this will be good for the world economy. Now Kishore, earlier today you asked a question directly of, of Ren about how you deal with the perception and then the reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, There is a reality that they've been blacklisted mm -hmm. but the perception is, is that they are potentially have a security threat. So how, if, that, if I may ask your question to Ren Zhengfei, is how do you combat that perception gap? Well, I think this kind of perception uh, should come from people's experience. In the past 30 years, Huawei has always believed in customer centricity. This is our core belief and core values. And in the past 30 years, Huawei has established a very good trust, trust-based relationship with our customers. And now US has slapped uh, sanctions on Huawei and they have been flying to countries trying to lobby these countries not to buy Huawei equipment, but those countries are still buying from Huawei, uh, even though U.S. is powerful, but you see the trust of customers is even more powerful. Focus right now on security. What are you putting most R&D in, or what should Huawei be putting most of its research and development in on security? Well, if you really wanted to know, I have to say, um, all the security researchers, uh, we are doing work for very detailed protocols and every parameters, and we do a lot of contributions to standards like 3GPP. And you know, uh, we have a group uh, focusing on security research in 3GPP that's named IC3. And IC3 has over 60 dedicates around, I mean, and uh, have seven meetings in this year and the last year and almost over 200 contributions for each of the meeting. And all the delegates discussed about that and to find the, the best solution for every like a weakness or vulnerability maybe happen in the network. So all the researchers will work very hard on this. We, we don't know all the things, uh, the things about like a political issues. We just uh, do our best to make the telecommunication network be the very secure. Okay. In about three or four minutes, we're going to be opening up the floor for questions. So um, get ready with your questions. We don't want to lag here. and We'll go to the floor in just a minute. Um, but I, I'll ask you, I mean, generally speaking, um, how damaging to global trade and to the perception issues, it has this, this trade war between China and the United States been? And, and Mr. Ren, are, are you an optimist or a pessimist that this can be resolved? Well, um, from the beginning, I've never paid any attention to uh, the trade wars because we are fully focused on patching or fixing the holes on our uh, bullet-riddled airplanes. And we have zero sales in the United States. So the trade wars between the two countries bear no impact on Huawei. So that's why we didn't pay any attention to the trade war between the two countries. And what we focus on is how can we provide and continue to provide uh, the best services and experience to customers and we focus on understanding, analyzing customer requirements and how to provide the best possible services to our customers even under the most difficult situations. And you see uh, the footfalls from the customers increased 69% this year and most of these visitors just come to see whether Huawei still survives. And first of all, they would just want to see the uh, shuttle buses picking people go to work and off work, whether they still run. And they will check whether the cafeteria, uh, whether employees will go to cafeteria for lunch, for breakfast, for dinner as usual, whether they buy meat, pork. 
and they will check whether the production lines are up and running. Even if we're up and running 24-7, uh, we can't keep up with the increasing um, demand from the customers, and the customers want more products, equipment from us. So uh, we're not in the situation as people might have expected, and we see customers have more trust in Huawei. Well, in the past, um, the customers are half convinced. Um, they have doubts whether Huawei can survive even without uh, U.S. components. But now they see that we survive very well. And probably we have drilled our own well on the downhill of Mount Everest. But drilling the well is not our intention. We wanted to use the water from the top of Mount Everest. No matter it, you see the Yellow River, Yangtze River, the water come from uh, the top of Mount Everest. So we hope we can tie this over. And uh, our long-term strategy is still want to cooperate with American counterparts. And the United States does not issue licenses for you. You have 28% of global network gear sales. Can you maintain that and build that? without the United States or its allies, if it convinces Germany or if it convinces the UK, other Western economies not to purchase your gear. Is 28% something that is sustainable or can you build that? <clears throat> Firstly, I think that uh, these allies you described will have to consider their national interests. Uh, what's important for the U.S. is U.S. first. And it's uh, highly likely that Germany will just let the U.S. take the money while they are waiting. I think that uh, the countries will have to think about their national interests. It's impossible for them to just blindly follow the U.S. without considering their national interests. If uh, the U.S. Uh, bans supplies from us, we've got our uh, secrets. But I cannot uh, let you know our secrets because I'm not authorized to tell you. Uh, I w we will have them, the solutions, when it happens. So when it happens, please come and interview me again. I will tell you then. First, yes. Uh, on, 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 on the trade war, I think it's important to understand, as I said at the beginning, that the trade war is just one small part of a much larger picture of a, a geopolitical strategic contest. But the United States, China has got the economic dimension, the political dimension, the military dimension, the cultural dimension, the primacy dimension. It's a multi-dimensional struggle. And so each has got its own uh, dynamic. So I, 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 I do agree with you that uh, the likelihood is that there'll be some kind of a temporary truce or trade settlement between the United States and China, but that's not necessarily driven by, how do you call it, uh, reason and logic. It's driven by the political logic of the fact that President Trump has to go for elections in 2020, to go for elections in 2020. He needs a good economy, a good stock market. To get a good stock market, he wants a good deal with, <laughs> with the United States. So that's, that's the kind of political logic that's uh, uh, driving this. But your, your question, the, the larger long-term question is, uh, can Huawei uh, survive if indeed the United States sustains its campaign again and, and gets its other friends to join it and so on and so forth? And I'm sure, and I think, I think Mr. Run has admitted this, it will create some shocks and difficulties for Huawei. Uh, but I, I cannot imagine, you know, I cannot imagine China allowing Huawei to collapse on the f in the face of a dedicated American onslaught. There's too much at stake here, too much at stake. So clearly, a tremendous amount of resources will be poured in to make sure that Huawei doesn't fail. Because at the end of the day, this is not just about Huawei. It's about the larger contest being going on within the two. 
And Huawei, in some ways, unfortunately, I feel like it's like a, it's like a chicken caught within two elephants, you know. <laughs> yeah, these two elephants <laughs> jog jogging, and here is this chicken trying to run around and get away from the two elephants. So I wish uh, Mr. Ren success, but I, I, I did tell him, be careful, huh? this, these two elephants are jostling a lot. And, and, and Huawei has got to be very agile and careful as, as it manages a very difficult uh, geostrategic <laughs> environment. <laughs> Well, I think it's not only a threat for Huawei, it's also a threat for the worldwide economy because when the <coughs> market leader in such an equipment is no longer available, uh, the others will not be able to, uh, to uh, bring their products on the market to the right extent. So, so uh, Nokia and Ericsson, I think, they are too small to take over these supplies for the world market. So we will have no technology for the next years and this will deeply influence our economy. So I think this would be really a, a Black Friday again which will happen if such a thing will come up. And it's more than just the issue of cost either. I mean, they, they're more scalable, and they're Absolutely. cheaper and some of those regional carriers in the United States and elsewhere, they've relied on that more affordable yeah. equipment, right? Right. I'd like to turn it over to the, I'm losing my voice, I'm sorry. Well, he did then got maula. I have a little, uh, quite a little code. Ooh, the local guests or the overseas guests, somebody from Germany, I believe, have the question? Is it? Yeah, okay, here. First of all, thank you very much for having us here. I think you need a, mic you need a microphone for the translation. Henrik Lages from Munich, Germany, from a little company doing a lot of artificial intelligence. First of all, thank you very much for having us here and also for your interesting talk about the two <laughs> elephants. Um, very impressive. Uh, I have a bit of an old-fashioned question. You are sitting in front of a wall of books. You know, you're writing the book of the future, but in what old books would you, would you read to do your strategic deep thinking? Like Mr. Wren, I mean, you think, I think you're a very deep thinker. So what kind of old book would you have next to your bed to read in that you could recommend to us <laughs> when you think how to solve this enormous strategic riddle? A tale of two countries, no. <laughs> <laughs> he wants to know you. <laughs> the other question was Mr. Run. I'll, I'll, tell, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what old book I'll read, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Apart from this book, it's, 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 it's as small as this book. I would read, and I, and I mean this quite sincerely, um, and I guess especially to a European audience, I would go back and read Machiavelli, The Prince. <laughs> Because we are in the middle of a remarkably complex, and in some ways, you know, it's going to be a, a long distance competition between two great powers. And managing such situations, I mean, having been a student of geopolitics now for over 40, 48 years now, uh, there's a certain logic in geopolitics, you know. You, you can actually sometimes predict things that are happening because it's a very logical thing that could happen. So, That's why it's important to understand that, that geopolitics has been around a long time. And the man who actually distilled the wisdom of geopolitics very well was uh, Machiavelli. And that's why, even though many European leaders deny that they read him, if you go to their bedrooms underneath the pillows, you'll find Machiavelli, <laughs> the Fritz. <laughs> I just want to know who's more Machiavellian, though, the world leaders right now. Yeah. In the future, it's your book. <laughs> in, in the future, is my next book, yeah, as yeah. China won. <laughs> Well, what's the answer to your <laughs> thesis? No, my, the, the answer to my thesis is actually everyone thinks so. And I say, and I ask the question, has the West lost it? Everybody thinks the answer is yes. Like, no, the answer is no. The West has not lost it, or more accurately, not yet. <laughs> yeah. And so I suggest that the West, you know, we, we are entering a new era of human history. And to just describe it very briefly, uh, from the year one to the year 1820, Out of 1,800, the last 2,000 years, the two largest economies of the world were always those of China and India. Now, it's only in the last 200 years that Europe has taken off and America has taken off. 
So the past 200 years of world history, when you view them against the backdrop of 2,000 years, have been a major historical aberration. Now, all aberrations come to a natural end, so it's perfectly natural to see the return of China and India. But when this happens, it's important for the West to adjust uh, strategically to this new environment. So I, I, that's why, in the book, I suggest what I call a 3M solution, minimalist, the West should interfere less in other countries. Multilateralists, which is what I've been emphasizing, use, use global multilateral institutions in the UN. And the third M, incidentally, in this book is Machiavellian. We have some over here. Yes, uh, Peng Bo the Gao Yuan. I'm from Bloomberg. The question is addressed to Mr. Ren. Uh, you said that uh, you could uh, license 5G technology to one U.S. company. I heard of uh, the discussions that you had with some of them. Uh, what is the progress? Uh, how much they should pay? And when will you announce the uh, license? So far, no U.S. company has uh, talked to us about the licensing. Uh, if uh, the uh, proxies or agents talk to us, it doesn't really mean much because this is so significant that uh, the larger companies will have to think carefully over the decision first. As long as they are willing to come to us and then discuss it, we will then find investment bank or other uh, proxies and we will then negotiate the contracts. But so far, uh, no progress on that regard. Yes. Uh, Mr. and I am a journalist from China. Uh, in one of your interviews, you describe your veto right. You have never used it. But things are different. When will you use your veto right to your team? I know that you believe in the philosophy of uh, flexibility, but I think that uh, there are matters uh, that you hold dear to your heart and you don't directly answer the sharp questions the journalists asked. And then you might end with uh, something you firmly believed in. So given the current uh, situation, what is the most important thing, bottom line? You know, uh, I look at the gestures of uh, my people. I will know what can be said and what cannot be said. I have the veto right, it is true. However, I think that it is like a sword over the head of the managers, but it cannot fall randomly. It will hurt people. It would have consequences uh, collectively. So when I have my opinion, I will first talk to people, talk to the team. People can oppose uh, my opinion. You know, in our internal community, uh, like the BBS community, a lot of people have different opinions from mine. And we have our blue army and pointing out the 10 mistakes that I made. I myself posted it in our internal community. I thought that it was a great post outlining the 10 mistakes I made. So the veto right cannot be used arbitrarily. I uh, treat it very carefully. In 2018, uh, we should have uh, removed the veto right, giving it over to the uh, management team. However, the Brexit happened, and we really don't want to have a Brexit situation in our company. We don't want to have important decisions uh, voted by the employees in the Brexit fashion. That is why we maintain the veto right. And in addition to the uh, veto right, uh, we also have a succession plan for the company. But it doesn't mean that my children or my family members will be the successors. It would be the executive members from our board of directors and supervisory board. And through the voting process, we will have a successors through a rotating mechanism to run the company. It is not a long term uh, for each person because I think that these are senior executives and we think that it would be wiser to have a shorter term for each one of them. Coming back to the veto right, 
I don't use it lightheartedly, but it is an important mechanism to uh, have the checks and balance in our company. That's how we sustain the healthy management. Retirement, are you? <laughs> Mia. <laughs> no, I'm not hinting that. The gentleman there, yes, you. Kia from New Zealand. My name is Sir Bob Harvey. Um, in New Zealand, which is a very small country, but we're going through a very difficult period because the government of New Zealand has decided that 5G is not uh, on their agenda and not acceptable, uh, which is uh, very disappointing, I have to say. But my question to Rem is simply this. Uh, it's not Machiavellian. It's more Marcus Aurelius, I think, which is started <laughs> up there. Uh, is why does not Rem uh, speak directly to Trump? Trump is a bully, and it seems to me that bullies actually can be confronted face-to-face -face better than negotiations in secret rooms. Why doesn't he just go to Washington and have it out? He <laughs> didn't <laughs> The uh, New Zealand uh, surfing competition has been facilitated by our 5G base stations. Uh, there were three base stations, actually. And after the meeting, uh, I would like to uh, give you a CD-ROM. And the CD uh, has recorded our celebration. And it is a, a record of uh, a team of uh, Parade. Over 100,000 people are, uh, mu are delivering the performance. It is a best a testament to the low latency of the technology. I think it is a good example of uh, implementing 5G in the media industry. Well, I don't have a channel of communication with Trump. I don't have uh, his mobile phone number. Maybe you can be the medium. <laughs> would, you, would you meet him and talk to him? Yes, I would, certainly. Donald Trump, if you're on live go right now on Bloomberg. <laughs> well, he has uh, private jets and he can come to China anytime. And I do not have private jets. And my airplane uh, is only made of paper. If it rains, it might fall. <laughs> This one here. Thank you. I'm from the Xinhua News Agency, and uh, my question is for Mr. Ren. Some people say that um, there may be a decoupling of the two uh, internets or two worlds, and some people even say the emergence of Huawei would even worse than that. Well, we see the 5G commercialization, and US is feeling very agitated about uh, Huawei's 5G technology. So do you think the 5G orders for Huawei uh, will change somehow? And previously, you mentioned Huawei is now fixing the holes. And uh, what are the holes that you haven't fixed yet? And also, how would you comment on the decoupling? Uh. Well, first of all, I think 5G technology has been exaggerated. While people uh, see the small uh, box as a atomic bomb, posing a big threat, but I never saw the 5G technology as such. Well, the development of 5G uh, originated from a mathematical paper published 10 years ago by a Turkish professor, Dr. Arikan. We uh, came across that mathematical paper, and we invested thousands of researchers uh, into analyzing and understanding this mathematical paper. Well, the United States was doing the exact same as at the same time. Uh, well, they based their theory on another uh, paper, and that paper was written by the uh, teacher of Professor Arikan. So at that same time, we were making efforts on 5G at the same time, and we were kind of uh, uh, 
uh, fellow uh, uh, fellow peers in the same research area, but 5G picked millimeter wave to build their 5G technology. The bandwidth is much wider than uh, uh, the current uh, middle frequency based 5G technology. However, millimeter waves propagation range is shorter. And the United States believes the theoretical breakthrough for millimeter wave or 6G can come faster than 5G commercialization. They didn't expect that 5G can get commercialized so quickly and get launched to the market. And we select centimeter wave that is uh, uh, medium uh, level frequency band. That is also a placing of bet because we picked the mid frequency. Not so many vendor picked mid frequency band. Not a lot of vendors chose that. How many vendors? also pick the same level of frequency band? Well, v very limited few. And we chose the centimeter wave, and we picked medium band. We also have research on millimeter wave, but we believe the centimeter wave will have stronger prospect in the future. And we believe 5G will have stronger prospect in the future. Well, unfortunately, we made the um, bet right again. We made the right bet once again, because uh, millimeter wave cannot be widely applied in the short term. That means 6G cannot be widely applied in the short term. While uh, we believe uh, 6G will be widely applied or commercialized only after 10 years, but 5G will already get fully commercialized, and there won't be much need for 6G because 5G's bandwidth will be wide enough for people to consume or uh, even more than enough for people to use. If people uh, have sufficient enough of bandwidth, then would there be a new cellular technology, 6G? Well, that's a question mark. Well, we cannot say that we are born to be always right. We are also placing bets. Uh, in the market, and we placed our bet on centimeter wave. And in terms of frequency allocation in China, China also happens to allocate a frequency based on centimeter wave. And in Middle East countries, they directly um, followed the frequency allocation in China. And Middle East countries are quite rich. They're very aggressive with technology deployment. So probably Middle East will be the high ground on 5G deployment. Probably in the future, China can catch up. But that's a possibility. It still takes hard efforts from China. So I think during the process, we do not have the conviction for victory. Maybe we're just lucky. We're just lucky that uh, this is the trend, and we made the right bet on the trend. So it seems like we seize the right timing. Maybe it's our luck. From Singapore over here, some, is it? yes, in the green here. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm from Singapore. that China has a vision uh, of being a cyber superpower, Wang uh, Luo and is hoping to influence global governance norms, as well as exporting this concept overseas. Um, I'd like to ask the panelists, where are you on this spectrum of, on the one hand, a free and open internet, and on the other, the China model, which places restrictions on content, data flow, infrastructure, and so on. Thank you. Nobody wants the. <laughs> <laughs> You're looking at me. No. <laughs> uh, Ren, do you want to talk about that? So here, well, first of all, we think the internet has driven 
um, the progress of human society, no matter it's uh, Facebook, Amazon, or Google, or Microsoft, or the Chinese internet companies, they have all made their contribution to drive the human society forward. And they've made their contribution to bridge the digital divide. We have to give them that recognition. We should recognize their contributions. Um, now people live in remote areas, in mountainous areas. They um, can, on, can they can get all the informations around the world. They can know what's happening around the world. Uh, yesterday, I met a Wall Street Journal journalist, and the journalist even visited uh, my home during my childhood. I told her that was not my uh, home. Uh, it was just an apartment uh, given to my parents after. Uh, the reform and open up. So when they look at our life in the past, it's a bit like uh, we're looking at the underdeveloped countries. Well, if people ask me what was my dream in my childhood, probably just to have a steam bun, because we didn't know what was the world like. But now you see in the world, children in villages, they see the new world. This is something positive. Of course, on the internet, there are hazardous uh, or negative content. And I think countries should govern those content. And that is positive and helpful uh, for social stability and the growth of young generation. Uh, if there is no management at all or no governance at all, I think that is not entirely good. Well, there is no good or bad about internet, and there is no good or bad about any model. It comes down to one sentence. We should all strive hard and create more wealth. If we have more wealth, we can drink more coffee. Well, you see coffee shops on our campus everywhere. Uh, and our R&D employees, they are quite stingy, and they don't want to spend their money on coffee. Uh, if they don't want to spend their money on coffee, then they might not be so advanced. They should use their money to spend on coffee. So I think internet has brought positive um, contribution. We should recognize that. You talk about any subject, right, before I lose my voice. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I've talked to a lot of foreign companies that have done <laughs> business in China. And in June of 2017, the Chinese government enacted the cybersecurity law, which would basically require um, foreign companies and local companies to house their data on Chinese citizens domestically in China. I mean, is that something that sends the wrong signal to the world that the government is not giving your digital sovereignty to the individual or to the individual companies. It's controlled. Uh, are you directing the question to me, to Mr. Rin? Well, we are not a internet company, and we uh, didn't pay attention to the rules and regulations governing internet companies. Maybe countries have different understandings, so I cannot comment on that. Uh, we are when they're working on the network, the infrastructure equipment. So how about the data go through and go where? We don't know that. So we have no idea about that, or maybe ask the international, you know, internet operations. They know that. Okay. Can I can I just add a quick word? Sure. Uh, in, in the side, you, know, you know, the regulations in the cyber world are very early. No one quite knows how to manage them. And if you if you want an ideal outcome, the ideal outcome clearly is some kind of global uh, multilateral understanding. But a global multilateral understanding, like for example, the law of the sea convention has to be negotiated among all 193 countries. And then all 193 countries, after they have agreed on the convention, they have to abide by it, right? And here, as we know, the United States is the leader uh, in internet by far. But the United States is also, as a country, reluctant 
it's almost like a, almost like a deep philosophical bias here to accept any kind of multilateral rules that will govern American uh, institutions and behavior. For example, uh, it'd be, take Facebook, for example, right? Facebook is, um, how do you say, selling political advertisements in, in UK that actually, if you, if you listen to this TED talk by Carol Cadwellader, that Facebook advertisements led to Brexit in some ways. Now, would the United States agree that this should stop and that you should have global regulation of such a thing? And, and that's the critical step that we have to take. Mm -hmm. We have to see, we have to all agree that perhaps given the damage or the uh, influence that these organizations have, they should be subject to global multilateral uh, regulation. And if, if we can take that first step, it's actually a big step forward. Well, at least uh, we have the same discussions at home in Germany. So also, uh, mostly driven by the companies, they try to keep their data in the meantime on European servers. There were just a new group being founded in Germany and also supported by the government, for example, to have such a German cloud available. The only uh, big difference is that it's not enforced by the government, but it's just an offer to the industry and the industry can decide on this. Uh, concerning the other part of this discussion, um, I think as soon as we have a, a democratic uh, government and de democratic uh, country as we are, uh, it's completely impossible to block things like the internet. So this will not work. And I'm also sure that perhaps in 20 years we will, uh, will have a different situation here in China as well and people get wealthier and the telecommunication is getting even better and more and more uncontrollable. We have one minute. Last question. Sorry, I had to go here. Yes. <clears throat> Microphone. Very quick. Yes, my name is Michael Bergfeld. I'm a professor of global family business from Munich, Germany. I help families navigate complex times when they go through a trajectory of complicated times like almost losing their legacy, which might happen in this case. Um, maybe just an observation and a suggestion in Machiavellian terms, if the prince cannot speak to the prince, send the children to speak to each other. They might have different interests. In the case of the president of the United States, the children run the business. You also have children who run the business. Maybe they can find common terms. And in conclusion to that, what would be your advice, Ren, for all the young people in the room? How should they position themselves as the next generation? What should they read? What should they learn? And how should they think about the world based on your incredible business legacy that you have built? Thank you. I think that uh, young people uh, should keep an open mind because uh, they are in a much better time than uh, we were because uh, back in the old days, uh, we could only access more information when we uh, were able to read books in libraries after getting to universities. But uh, prior to that, uh, in the high schools, we didn't have uh, such good libraries. So I think that young people should always keep an open mind. Secondly, they should learn how to cooperate with each other because uh, you can only have uh, multi-wins if you cooperate with each other. Thirdly, I think that uh, perseverance is a very important hallmark for uh, the young generation because time flies if they just um, jump from this to that and fail to be persistent in one domain, they can hardly be successful. I've seen some children, uh, they were very young, about two to three years old, when I knew them. They listened to the same song, they listened to the same video a dozen of times. It turned out that they uh, grew up fine and become somebody. Uh, so I think that uh, it's very important for them not to think that uh, they are they're really amazing. They should be persistent and they should focus on some cutting edge things so that they can make breakthroughs. Maybe you need to come down to my town. Hong Kong and give a speech to the children there. <laughs> <laughs> That's for another discussion. 
Ladies and gentlemen, if you could put your hands together for Ren Zhengfei and the distinguished panelists.